G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm the Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country here in Canberra and uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. Sovereignty was never ceded, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. The Australia Institute likes to do these webinars at least weekly, uh, but the days and times do vary. So head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find out all the details for our upcoming webinars. And just a few tips before we begin to help this all run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A button where you can type in questions for our panel. And you should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments on their questions as well. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll have to boot you out. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but we'll do it if we need to. And finally, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and will be posted up on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel. You can find that at australiainstitute.tv, um, hopefully by the end of today, but within the next day, basically. So today's webinar is really important. I want to thank you all for coming along today. It's about the campaign to raise the age of criminal responsibility and to get kids out of prison. I'm really delighted to introduce all our uh, four speakers. Lee is a proud Milleroy, born and raised Mount Druitt, and she's the Mount Druitt Community Engagement Officer at Just Reinvest. A single mum to five kids and grandmum to 11 grandchildren, she was raised strong in identity, community and culture through both her mother and her father's family. Both herself and her family have experiences with the criminal justice system, which really allows Julie to better understand the forces that pull our young people into it. And she strongly believes in the need for early intervention and for better community-based support for families. Mina Singh is a Yoda Yoda, an Indian woman born and living on the lands of the Kulin Nation. Mina has held senior roles within organisations such as Victoria Legal Aid, the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, and most recently, the Human Rights Law Centre. Her consulting work has seen her work with organisations such as Jira Brimbank Community Legal Services and Hanover Housing Services, which is now called Launch Housing. She's currently undertaking a PhD of research into the experiences of Aboriginal women and women of colour who have practised as lawyers. Sophie Trevitt is Executive Officer at Change the Record, which has as its mission to end the incarceration of and family violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Sophie's a solicitor, campaigner and strong advocate for reforming the justice system and ACT co-chair of Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. She practiced in a wide range of civil and admin law before managing the youth prison and police accountability practice for an Aboriginal legal service in Alice Springs. Sophie began her work in Alice Springs just as the Royal Commission into the detention and protection of children in the NT was underway. And Dr Nick Fancourt is a paediatrician based in Darwin, where he provides outreach services to Dondale Youth Detention Facility. He works as clinical lead for adolescent health at the Royal Darwin Hospital and as a research fellow at the Menzies School of Health Research. His clinical and research focuses on ad adaptive health systems for vulnerable populations and most recently he's been working on new models of care for the assessment and treatment of neurodevelopmental and behavioural disorders in Indigenous kids. So g'day Sophie, Julie, Mina and Nick, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Sophie, to kick us off, I wonder if you can tell us about the Raise the Age campaign and why we need to raise the age of criminal responsibility. Hi, Ev and everyone. Thanks so much. Can I just check? Is my internet holding up okay? It is for now, yep. <laughs> okay, just let me know if it doesn't. Um, we had some internet problems this morning. Um, I'm also zooming in from Ngunnawal country like Ebony, um, and I feel very lucky to be on this beautiful unceded um, country during lockdown. I also pay my respects to elders past and present um, always, but particularly in light of the conversation we're having today around Raise the Age. Um, so I want to start by, by, by saying that Raise the Age is a campaign that came about because of the way in which these unjust laws impact on, on very young children, children under the age of 14, um, and particularly on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. Today is September the 8th, which is um, actually the anniversary of when Auntie Tanya Day, her birthday, she passed away um, as a result of public drunkenness laws in Victoria, which is why I'm wearing pink. Um, and 
the connection there, I guess, is that we have a whole system of unjust laws in the criminal legal system um, that hurt particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, but, but a large number of people within our communities. That um, horrific death also sparked a community change um, and, a, and a big campaign which led to the overturning of public drunkenness laws in Victoria. Um, and I guess out of this horrible tragedy, we saw the power um, of communities and families coming together um, and lobbying governments for reform. And that's what we're hoping to achieve with the Raise the Age campaign. Um, the campaign to get children out of prison has been going on for a really long time and has been led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, particularly, at least in my experience, Aboriginal grandmothers um, who have been at the forefront of campaigning for their kids and their grandkids um, to be kept safe from, from prisons and harmful interventions. Um, about a year ago, we built on some of that um, you know, that long legacy of work um, and brought together a range of organisations, um, medical organisations, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, human rights, legal organisations. I think there are 100 organisations now as part of our Raise the Age coalition um, who all came together under the shared banner of trying to keep children as young as 10 out of the criminal justice system, um, make sure that they can't be arrested, can't be hauled before courts, um, can't be trapped in this, in this cycle, um, in this damaging institution um, of the criminal legal system, which so often takes kids away from their families and their community and schooling um, and can really set them on a trajectory that ultimately causes them harm for the rest of their lives. Um, so we launched the campaign last year. Um, we were hoping that attorney generals would get on board and would commit to raise the age. Um, that hasn't happened across the board. It's a state and territory issue. So we need every state and territory to change their laws. Um, but we have seen some progress. The ACT has committed to raise the age to at least 14 and they're in the process now of drafting that legislation. Um, so that's extremely exciting. Um, but other states and territories have been much slower to, to move. So we're currently watching Victoria and Western Australia really closely um, um, with the hope that they will, they will be the next states to move um, and to raise the age to 14. But what we know we really need now is we've convinced decision makers on the, on the policy, on the fact that locking up kids doesn't keep the community safe, it hurts children, it hurts families. What we need now is to show decision makers that they have the support of the public and that they can be brave and change these laws and that the majority of Australians will back them in doing that. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Julie, I wanted to come to you next. Uh, as a parent of a child who was caught up in the criminal legal system and through your work in Just Reinvest, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like for kids and their families who really what they need is support and services but end up being met with a, a police response instead? I imagine it most, must be incredibly both scary and infuriating. As a parent, it was a big struggle for me because it was a long process um, that became, you know, over two years of waiting and finding that right support for myself and my daughter. So my, my daughter, when she started hanging around that wrong age group, um, the wrong crowd, um, become in trouble. And I, I struggled just um, trying to find a service that could support me because my daughter wasn't 12. Um, so it made, made even the process feel even longer because as a parent, I was trying to do everything I could to try and get that support for my daughter where I, I just couldn't get that anywhere. That's why I have a big thing around early intervention where I, I believe if, you know, families are helped um, a little earlier in the process, then uh, it wouldn't turn out that bad at the other end. Do you know what I mean? So, Yeah. Yeah, and so when you say um, your daughter was around 12, was that an issue where services were designed for kind of different ages than your daughter was at the time? Or was it just that you couldn't find any services available to you? What kind of problems did you encounter? She wasn't 12, so I couldn't find any services to um, support us. So a lot of the services out here in Mount Druitt where they only support children who are 12, and then the next thing I struggled with was because she, you know, got into so much trouble and then had so many charges. 
where I still couldn't be supported until all those, um, you know, charges went through the system and she was fully sentenced on those um, until we were given that support. So it was well over two years um, in and out going to court where we didn't receive nothing. And finally, um, when we did receive that support from a service, um, they could only work with my daughter for um, 12 weeks. So, uh, but it was really, I was grateful that that service could extend at the time for another um, eight weeks, I think it was. So, but that, that helped that it could be extended, but a lot of services only have those where they would work for that time frame, and that's it. So then you're looking for another service to support you. Yeah. Um, we might come back a little bit to some of those experiences, Julie, but Mina, um, looking at the legal side of things, um, I mean, what kind of age are we talking about that kids are going into prisons and, and what are some of the main problems that children encounter once they get caught up in this system? Yeah, well, I mean, because the age of criminal responsibility is so low as 10 years of age, that's exactly when kids can go to jail. And we've seen kids, um, whether it's uh, being arrested and put into custody, held on what we call remand, which is you're still waiting for um, your legal matter to be finished. So you're still waiting to be sentenced. Kids could be held in, in, in jails, in police cells, which of course is highly traumatic. Um, any experience with with the criminal legal system is incredibly traumatic. Um, and, you know, we see when you look at the types of offending that are, that are going on, um, when you're talking about kids as young as 10 and up to that 14 um, years of age, that sort of group, you're really talking about offending that doesn't require much forethought or planning. You're really talking about spur of the moment type activity. So maybe uh, stealing a chocolate bar or a drink from a shop or maybe engaging in criminal damage. The types of offending is very low. Um, and if we're not addressing what that sort of behaviour is and where it's coming from, if we're not looking holistically at what the child's um, environment is, what struggles they might be facing, um, you know, are they connected with school? Are they connected with culture, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids? You know what's going on with family and stuff. If we're not looking at the child's circumstances holistically, um, you know, any response that doesn't address those things, any response that just you know throws a kids in a kid in prison and and you know leaves it at that won't lead to long term change or long term positive outcomes. And there's research to say that um, the earlier a child becomes engaged with the criminal legal system the more likely they are to return to it as they get older and into adulthood. Um, and, you know, there's so much research also that says that prisons do not rehabilitate. Prisons are not positive places. They're inherently violent places where there's a huge imbalance of power. Um, and, you know, a child going into prison is subject to things such as strip searches, um, which if it wasn't for the law would be considered sexual assault. So, you know, these sorts of traumas that children are experiencing at a very young age uh, is, is highly damaging unless it's addressed with, with trauma-informed responses. Yeah, that's just awful to think about um, those types of things happening to kids as young as 10, 11, 12. That's primary school age. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of parents on the line with us today. Nick, as a paediatrician, I can't imagine that incarceration is in any way beneficial to the health and development of kids as young as 10. Can you reflect on some of those health impacts that kids are encountering? Yeah, thanks, Evan. Look, I think there are, there are really two things to say about that. Um, one is that children as young as 10 and certainly all adolescents um, you know, through what is a really crucial stage of development, right? This is a time when we're sort of learning to disconnect a bit from family and to create our own identity and develop our own sort of independence and learn all these skills while we're surrounded by school and education and community and, you know, all these important features that help to drive that developmental transition. Those are complicated times for in, in, in the best of circumstances. Um, and the times when we know, you know, from a scientific point of view, from a neuroscience, brain science point of view, and um, brains are still developing until the early 20s. And they're developing things, you know, as, um, as things that we may take for granted, like impulse control and executive function, like function and sort of understanding 
the world around us. And, and, and physically, kids are also small, right? The average weight of a 10-year-old child is about 32 kilos for a boy and smaller for a girl. These are very small, vulnerable children. And, and then what we layer on top of that is that the, the cohort that the justice system tends to capture is actually a cohort of children who are significantly disabled. And they're often disabled because their brains haven't developed properly for a variety of reasons. Um, and that leads them into um, responses, emotional responses that, that the symptom that we see is aggression and, and disruptive behavior. And that's how they end up in the justice system. Um, but what it means to us from a developmental perspective is actually we've got children who might be 10 or 14 or 16, but if you actually spend some time with them, you know, do some proper psychology assessments, you, what you find is that their, um, their level of functioning is often less than 10. Um, and so we've you know, got this cohort of very, very uh, vulnerable kids who are not always performing at their chronological age. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite confronting, isn't it? I mean, Sophie, coming back to you, um, you know, as a white girl growing up, I was always told to trust in the police. I would obviously have an extremely different experience than uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. As a lawyer, you talked about when you went to uh, Alice Springs and were practicing in Alice Springs that, um, you know, that you were not aware of a single non-Indigenous child that was incarcerated in that youth detention centre. What does that tell us about how this system is failing Aboriginal kids in particular? Yeah, I mean, Julie will also be able to talk to this um, and about the way in which Aboriginal kids in particular are targeted um, and harassed by police, um, as well as sort of entrenched it at every stage of the criminal legal system. Um, I'll just say the first thing off the back of um, some comments that Nick made. I really think that there's this real spectrum of kids that are getting caught up in the criminal legal system. Some of the kids that we find who are being held in detention centres for really long periods of time have these, yeah, like a whole bunch of different things going on. They might have physical illness, they might have disabilities, a whole bunch of things that make them particularly vulnerable. But you also get kids who are just being naughty, you know, like kids that, that I worked with in Alice Springs were doing seriously naughty things um, like throwing rocks at a car or graffitiing um, private businesses. You know, these are naughty things that are, that are causing people damage and, and are, you know, understandably making people angry and upset and maybe costing money. Um, but they're also normal behaviours. But when that kid is then confronted with police, maybe they're assaulted by police, when they are routinely put into police cells, when they're held in detention centres, that then becomes a, a part of a system that's very hard to get out of. Um, so you effectively trap and normalise children um, in these extremely punitive, damaging institutions, as opposed to doing what you could do, which is engage with that young person, find out why aren't they attending school? You know, what's going wrong there that means that that kid isn't able to engage in the classroom? Or is something going wrong at home? Um, you know, that, that means that they don't want to be hanging around at home at night. Or are they actually just caught up with the wrong crowd? Like all of us, you know, definitely I was when I was a teenager, but like you, Ebony, as a, as a white girl from an affluent family, that didn't attract the police. Um, it attracted the attention of my teachers who then provided me with support, um, which is a very different response to the response that say, kids that I worked with in Tennant Creek or, or Alice Springs received, which is that the police are often called to the school by teachers and kids are arrested at school, um, you know, or, or you have situations like Julie described where kids are going through a really tough time and families are trying to get them help and support and that's being denied to them. And they're being locked out of the services that we all should be providing for, for kids and young people to try to make sure they can grow and thrive um, in their homes, in their communities, in their schools. So I think that's the sort of broad point to the point of um, that, that you specifically asked about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. When I worked in Alice Springs and, and the Barclay region, I never saw a non-Aboriginal child um, be incarcerated. That's not to say that it never happened, I, but I was there for three years and, and it never happened in the Barclay region when I was there. Um, and I think that that's because of a, a range of points in time at which the system discriminates against these kids. You know, it's from police 
targeting and harassing kids and the kids will tell you, you know, that this particular cop knows them, knows their family. Um, we will refer to them by name and their family by name and, and say that, you know, they know that these are bad kids. Um, so we know what happens at that point. It happens in the courtrooms. There are, you know, it it is um, like an unfortunate reality that, that courtrooms and the legal system is not a neutral space. Um, you may have seen in the news um, there was an investigation over a judge in Alice Springs who presided over matters with, with kids that I represented who was openly racist in court repeatedly. Um, so, you know, there are biases entrenched within the legal system and there have been a number of studies that show that Aboriginal kids are more likely to be sentenced to time behind bars than non-Indigenous kids who commit the same crimes. So you've got two kids being naughty, doing something wrong. Aboriginal kids are sent to prison non-Aboriginal kids and maybe put on community orders, um, good behaviour bonds, things that take them out of the criminal justice system. And then you have when these kids do go through that process, they're put into prisons for longer when they're Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. So this is a whole system that has discrimination built in at every single point along the way. Mm. Um, Julie, I'll come to you next. Is that your experience in the Mount Druitt community that um, Aboriginal kids kind of get a tougher time from police and, and that type of thing? Yeah, I think it is because, you know, my my daughter, you know, had non-Indigenous friends as well where, you know, she'd be, my daughter would automatically be also refused, but where others with her, you know, at the same place, same time, they they wouldn't get what my daughter was getting either. So, yeah, I do I do believe that that happens, yes. And can you tell us a little bit more about the work you do um, as a community engagement officer in Mount Druitt with Just Reinvest? What are the types of things that you do? What supports do families need? Well, at the moment, it's um, around having conversations with mobbing community, um, having yarns with them, what you know, me, myself, talking about what my struggle is and, and then they're comfortable, you know, having it that yarn, what their struggles are with services and police and whatever's going on for them. Yeah. And how long have you been doing that now, Julie? Do you feel like um, those sorts of things, that, that, that there's better services available now than um, when you were kind of struggling to look for things for your daughter or is it still really a struggle for a lot of families? I th I believe it's still really a struggle, um, you know, just because of yarns I have with mobbing community as well, where they, they're struggling with what I was struggling with, with in similar situations. So it does still happen. Yeah. Um, Mina, coming to you next, I guess, um, you know, for a lot of people probably who are watching, they won't have necessarily even engaged with the, the legal uh, the criminal legal system or the criminal justice system at all, it can be really hard, I think, for people to imagine what these kids are, are going through or, or the different backgrounds. Is that a bit of a, a, an obstacle to people coming on board with this campaign that, you know, that idea that, well, well I knew right from wrong when I was young, that type of thing? Do you encounter a lot of that in this campaign? Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a lot that isn't known willfully or, or however, for whatever reason, about the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in, in Australia and how, um, you know, how invasion and colonisation has led to entrenched disadvantage now and, you know, the, the, the basic denial of rights to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people compared to non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and has... Um, just created very different outcomes for our community. Um, and so people tend to look at this situation. I, I find two things. First thing, people are shocked um, when they hear that children as young as 10 can be put into jail and can be arrested and, and the whole works. A lot of um, that comments today, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then the second thing is that people often move very quickly to, a, oh, well, if they've done the wrong thing, then that's appropriate or that idea of, oh, well, I knew right from wrong at 10 years of age. You know, we're talking about kids who haven't had the advantages that a lot of us have, ha have had. Um, you know, if you think about the things that keep us out of prison, if I think of the things that have kept me safe, um, you know, it's things like, you know, always having a stable household, my parents always being in employment, 
having been connected to high school and primary school, you know, having uninterrupted education, not having significant health issues, no mental health issues growing up, no significant traumas growing up. All of those things keep us safe. And, you know, if you think of any of those things coming into play, you start to kind of, you know, create a picture where kids become much more vulnerable to acting out, um, act, acting in those naughty ways, as Sophie said, or acting in more serious um, ways that get them in trouble with the law. So we really need to think about what are the experience of these kids. And like Julie's shared with us, um, her experiences and her daughter's experiences, this is who we need to listen to. We need to hear voices of those people who are experiencing the legal system because they're the ones that are actually the experts of the criminal legal system, not us lawyers, not us, you know, the judges or the decision makers, the police. It's actually people experiencing these, these very oppressive systems that have the knowledge and the expertise to be able to say, this is what's needed. So, you know, to hear Julie say very clearly, you know, we needed programs for younger kids. We need programs that go longer than 12 weeks. That's, that's where the knowledge is and that's where the expertise is, what we really need to hear. Yeah, Nick, coming back to your experiences, um, uh, we've obviously seen a lot about Dondale in particular in the Northern Territory. Um, do you think there's a, an understanding in the community of kind of just how damaging incarceration can be for children? Oh, I think we've still got a long way to go to um, get you know, a good understanding in the community about what this means. Uh, I think, um, you know, we're five years after the Royal Commission um, and we're still seeing a government that's reversing changes directly made in response to that commission. So we're, we're on a path backwards. Um, and, and I think the government, you know, is responding in, in part to a lot of misunderstanding in the community. Um, so there's a lot to be done, I think, to, you know, for all of us to be talking to each other, educating, you know, our community and other members in our professions and our next door neighbours. There's a, a lot to be done, you know, as Julia and Mina have said, around really providing a voice for children, young people and their families. Um, so that these things are not just testimonials in a Royal Commission. These are everyday stories that we understand and hear from on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, and Sophie and Mina, I'm not sure which of you uh, might answer this, but for people who are kind of like, okay, well, if a kid's stolen a bike or graffiti, yes, I can see that you'd want to divert them. But for more serious offenders, you know, surely... The system this is the system that should work for them they should be behind bars what is the response to the campaign to people who I guess are worried about that public safety element um yeah absolutely people are right to be concerned about their safety um but we need to have responses that uh respond to the individual child who's who's committed the offense and look at exactly what that child's circumstances are as Nick said before we could have kids who are 14, 15, 16 who are who are um, develop who, who are uh, behaving or, or acting cognitively at a much younger age. So, you know, we need to have responses to offending that match up with the child's individual experiences and have age appropriate responses to to what this offending is. And you know, it's very likely that if a child is um, uh, engaging in more serious offending somewhere earlier they've engaged in very low level offending and that's where as julie said earlier there needs to be that early intervention um, and that addressing of what's going on um, and you know looking at it from a, a different a, a few different angles in terms of you know are they engaged with education what's their mental health like what's the physical um, side of things going on for them you know um, are they connected with culture have they got ties with families you know are they in a safe space at home all of these things need to, to be addressed, but um, you know, it, you know, there we need to think differently about how we respond to things. And simply locking up children in prison keeps you know might keep community safe for that period of time, but it doesn't address what's going on for that child and why that offending has happened in the first place. Yeah, and uh, I used to uh, my roommate used to be a, a criminal lawyer, um, Sophie. She always used to explain to me um, about how 
you know, uh, being incarcerated really, um, you know, has such a huge impact on people's lives. And what the community doesn't understand is that most people end up back in the community, you know, unless you're Ivan Malat, all of these people are actually part of our community. The idea should be to rehabilitate them and then they are going to end up in the community. That's obviously particularly obvious for children. Um, so I think you're still on mute there, Soph, but um, can you just tell us how important it is, you know, that the focus does shift to rehabilitation because, you know, obviously these are little kids right at the start of their life. Totally. I think... The, the, the first thing to say is that it's actually very, very rare for children under the age of 14 to commit any of these sort of serious crimes. That's much more common in, in older cohorts. Um, so, you know, late teens and, and adulthood. Having said that, the principles still apply, right? Like, what is the point of taking folks who do something, even something serious, putting them in a place where all the evidence tells us they are more likely to offend again in the future and worse because of that experience within prisons and the correctional system. So these places do nothing to keep us safe, the rest of the community safe in the long term, and they certainly do nothing to help those individuals. And that's the case for adults. And then when you think about it for a child, taking a child, as Mina said, there are a range of things that we have in our life that help us grow healthily and keep us strong and mentally well and physically well. And some of those things are education, going to school, being connected with our families, being connected with culture, being connected with our community. All of those things are ripped away when we take a child out of their family and, and put them in, in a detention centre or in a prison. So when we think about well, what happens on that very, very rare instance where a child does something seriously wrong, I guess I have two questions. One is, how does it make any sense that we can say a 10-year-old is too young to be held criminally responsible for shoplifting, but if they do something seriously wrong, then they are, it is okay to hold them criminally responsible and send them to prison. That doesn't make any sense. Mm. Second point is, when a young person does something seriously wrong on the rare occasion, we have to look at that kid and go, okay, something has gone seriously wrong in that child's life. There is a child doesn't act with extreme violence. They don't behave in a way that is repeatedly destructive unless something has gone wrong. And it's our job as adults in the community to go, okay, where are the gaps? Where are the needs that are not being met for that child? How do we meet them to make sure that that child is safe and healthy and well, and also the whole community is kept safe and healthy and well. So that might mean not sending them to prison but having a look as, as Nick said and, and going, okay, is there an underlying disability here? Or is there a health need that actually needs to be treated? Or is this child acting up so badly and not engaging with school because there is a learning issue? And actually what we need is to support that child to be able to learn you know, in a school environment. And maybe that means it needs to look like something different. Or is there something seriously wrong going on at home? Has that child been exposed to trauma that we need to address? And how do we do that in a way that isn't re-traumatizing? So not just by involving the child protection system, which we know is often a, a funnel straight into the criminal justice system, but how do we engage with that family? How do we engage with social services and, and family support services to make sure that kid is getting the best care and support and so are their family um, that they need? Those are the questions we should be asking. Every time we send a child to prison, there have been so many adults along the way who could have intervened and helped if they were given the, the resources and the backing um, to be able to provide that child with something better than sending them to a prison cell. Mm. Can I, uh, just to reflect on that a little bit and, and just maybe flip that around, Sophie, because it's the experience that we have, right? Is that um, like in a, from a health sense, we see these kids a group of these kids when they're young, we pick them up for various different reasons because in some somehow they've made it through to their GP and other into the health services. And we're seeing, you know, there's been a bit of a conversation around fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, for instance, in the chat. Like we see these kids when they're young and we get them onto um, early intervention plans and supports um, early in life. Um, there's another group of kids who come through the education sector and are picked up by education identified as need, having high needs and problems and the same with child protection services. There, there are you know still good people who work within child stretch child protection services, particularly in the territory, and, and they do pick up you know some of these kids in, in different ways. It's just that we have this this set of children who for for many of them, the first time they hit 
um, someone who can look at this sort of issue in a health and disability or um, uh, in a sort of high needs framework is when they're within a justice framework. And the justice system at the moment isn't set up to respond to that. Um, and so, you know, we know we've got the ability to do early intervention and identification, and we see some of those children, but the children who hit justice first are the ones who are uh, left wanting um, and have the worst experience, because that side of social services hasn't yet adjusted to thinking and delivering services in this way. Um Excellent. We might go to questions from the audience now. Um, the first one is from Abhishek, uh, who asks, what factors have prevented state and territory governments from increasing the age of criminal responsibility? Mina or Sophie, do you want to take that one? Soph? Yep. Um, sure. So I think the, the short answer to this is that these are political factors. Um, in the conversations that we have with politicians, I would say the vast majority, it's extremely rare that a politician will come back and say, I don't agree. We think that kids should, should go to prison. That is the best response. The vast majority of members of parliament are coming back and saying, we agree that the criminal justice system is harmful. We have heard the messages from, you know, otherwise quite conservative institutions like the AMA, the Law Council of Australia, we've heard these medical authorities saying that it's not doing these kids any good. Um, it, it's also harming these kids. It makes it more likely that they will grow up and be unemployed, be homeless, develop mental health issues. Like there's so much damage that comes from sending a child to prison. Politicians at large accept that. But what they say to us is, you need to show us that the community will support us if we raise the age. I think for so long, state and territory and Commonwealth governments have approached um, their, their role and electoral cycle, cycles in particular with a, with a law and order, tough on crime response. And often there's been a real race to the bottom when it comes to who can go harder and tougher when it comes to um, youth crime, um, also, you know, a lot of racial fear mongering. We saw that um, with some of the fear mongering in Melbourne around African youth gangs. You know, we see this time and time again and it works, right? You know, we've seen through the electoral cycle that this often works. So there needs to be a powerful incentive for members of parliament to stop doing that and to engage with something else. And I think we have seen some signs that that is possible. Um, you know, there were some really aggressive law and order campaigns run in the Northern Territory and in Queensland at the last elections, which did not um, return those, those parties to power. Um, but, um, you know, but both those states have recently passed some extremely punitive youth justice laws in response to, to public pressure and, and a lot of media misinformation. Um, so I think that there are, there are two big, you know, um, areas of work that we have ahead of us. One is about educating the media and trying to change some of that really base level fear mongering, um, cheap shot, you know, law and order media campaigning that we see in the tabloid press in particular. And the other side of it is demonstrating to our local members of parliament that the community is behind them. That we know from some polling that the Australia Institute did that the majority of Australians don't know that 10 year olds are sent to prison. And when they find out, they think that that's wrong and it should be raised to at least 14. We need to work out ways of showing parliamentarians that if they do the right thing, if they're a little bit brave, um, then they will be backed in by their community. Thank you. Um, the next question. Can I, sorry, can I add something yeah. to that as well? Um, you know, a lot of the, the rhetoric we hear, um, particularly from politicians is a real othering of people, of disconnecting certain groups of people from the rest of, of society and saying well that's okay that group of people is expendable or you know we, it doesn't matter what happens to them and I think there needs to be sort of a retelling of who it is that our community is and that community includes everyone even people in prison even people who offend people who are disadvantaged um, there's you know there's such a disconnect between so many groups of people uh, that you know lots of politicians make us you know, like to, you know, make us feel okay about just worrying about ourselves. But we really need to think more expansively and inclusively about who makes up our community. And, you know, the fact that, you know, kids can go into jail and then come out means they're always part of our community. And, um, 
you know, and, and you know, we can talk about so many different cohorts of people um, in Australia, but you know, I think it's really important to people um, for people to get across to their, you know, their local MPs, the politicians that supposedly represent them. Um, about caring for the whole of community that um, people need, you know, we need to see responses that ultimately do protect community. Prisons don't protect community. Um, the, the other programs, the other supports that, that Sophie, Nick and Julie have all spoken about, these are the things that keep community safe and that's what we want to see more investment in. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Olivia Greenwell. She says, is raising the age in legislation enough to also affect the cultural change necessary to correct over-policing and biases in court, or is it just the starting point? I might start with you, Sophie. Yeah, sure. And then I'd love to throw to Julie to talk a bit about what might need to happen for at a community yeah. level for policing in particular to change. Um, I think the answer is it's just the start. You know, changing the law to mean that children under the age of 14 can't go to prison is is super important. That basically sets a new sort of benchmark and a new norm within our communities that say when we think about um, children under the age of 14, we need to think about them differently, not as potential offenders, but as kids that we have a duty of care to, to look after and to nurture and to make sure they're given all those opportunities to grow and thrive. I think it also um, puts some responsibility on different institutions. So instead of, um, you know, the education system, um, instead of child protection, instead of the Department of Housing, all being able to call the police and, and say, no, nah, this is a problem for the police, this is a problem for the police, they actually have to go, no, we have a duty of care towards these young people and their families. So what are we going to do to make sure this family has adequate housing? Or what are we going to do with when this kid is disengaging from school? Instead of just suspending them or expelling them or calling the police, we have an obligation towards that child to make sure they get a good education. So I think it's just the start. But we also know that racism and discrimination, you know, extend through all of these institutions. Um, and there's a long way to go, I think, to make sure that the, there's genuine cultural reform within our whole communities and within, within these specific institutions. Um, what we don't want is to create a system where we change the law, but because we don't change any of the other drivers, because we don't address any of the other underlying things that, that leads to kids getting into trouble, like housing, like troubles at home, like the education system not working for kids, it just means that as soon as the child turns 14, the police get involved and arrest them and send them to prison. That's also um, not going to be a good outcome for that young person or their families. So it really needs to be a combined reform um, of both the, the sort of social services, the big institutions that government run um, that can either help or, or harm people. Centrelink is a great example of an institution that could help prop families up, help families when they're struggling, but instead often harms them. We need to combine that with raising the age um, to make sure that we have that sort of hard protection in place for children under the age of 14. Yeah. Um, Julie, coming to you next, um, raising the age, Sophie's just said it's just one of many things that we need to do. You work at the community level. What other things would you like to see change or do you think the community needs um, to help make that start make that shift I just think for any sort of change people start need to listening to um, those people with lived experiences in the community because you know they're the ones or well, we're all the ones who are struggling um, where I feel these voices need to be heard as well um, with my work with Just Reinvest, like we have, um, my daughter is one of the youth ambassadors, so her and another youth, youth ambassador, where, you know, they've started talking with young people around, you know, what their issues that they put up with and being in and out of that system. Um, so just, just their group, like yarning with one another and listening to one another's stories, they're talking about what they would like to see change. Um, where I think this is a good starting point because these are the young fellas who are going through all those issues and around like their group who they meet with and stuff. Now they, they've they also got a, um, they started up an Oztag um, team for young people out here in Mount Druitt where they've gone through a couple of comps now, but them doing that, a lot of these young fellas who are a part of that Oztag team 
um, a lot of services out here in Mount Druitt are saying that they won't engage. Where these young kids, this is their idea, this is what they're doing, and, and it's working. Like you know, because of lockdown now, they they're going into their third competition where this is going really good, and it's what they wanted to, you know, create, and they're doing that for themselves. Yeah, that sounds amazing, generated from the kids themselves. Um, what about as a parent? What kind of support do you, people need? Is it help keeping um, kids at school? Is it, I'm just not, I'm not kind of clear on what are some of the things that are missing that people would really like or need access to that people struggle to, to access? It's a bit of everything because it's the same within the education system. Like I went through it with my own daughter, like she wasn't given a long enough chance at school um, to see change with her behaviour and whatever. Like she was given a week and a half and I was told that that scene wasn't for her. She needs to be in another situation. I said, but you don't even know my daughter. She's been here like a week and a half. How can you say a school setting is not for her where... Mm -hmm. They, they didn't want to keep her there or give her that chance. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah, uh, it would be incredibly frustrating. Um, the next question I've got here is probably for you, Nick. Um, it's from Steve Caruana. He says, evidence from WA shows that more than one in three young people detained in Banksia Hill uh, had uh, FASD and other studies show young people with disabilities are vastly overrepresented in youth detention centres. Um, Nick and Sophie's experience also demonstrates that there's awareness of this. So what needs to be done to divert young people with disabilities from the justice system and what role do police have to play in that? Maybe to you first, Nick. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll just take a step back just for the wider audience. So we're talking about here is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is a, a, a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder. And um, it's caused by um, uh, the developing child and um, pregnancy um, being uh, affected by alcohol. And um, lots of mothers aren't aware that they're pregnant when they're still drinking. And so it's a, you know, it's a common issue. It's not, this is not a thing about blame or fault. This is something that happens across all walks of, um, of our society um, and, and affects um, you know, lots of different groups. Um, and the, the outcome is, um, you know, collection of children who have really severe neurodevelopmental disabilities. We're talking about children who have disabilities in at least three main areas, whether it's speech or language or cognition and intellect, executive function, um, attention, uh, uh, depression, anxiety, these kinds of things. So they're major functions that you lose at least three areas on. So it's significant disability in that. Um, study from Western Australia that was referenced has really become a, a really seminal piece of work for us to understand the tr what this true heavy burden is. The other thing about that study was that it was actually amongst those 99 children they looked at, so 36 of them had FASD, but 90% of them had a severe disability in at least one neurodevelopmental domain. So there was a, a, a huge component of, of disability within detention centres. What needs to happen? So let's go back a little bit to the Royal Commission. So the Royal Commission had a direct recommendation that every child should be screened for FASD, and that probably means actually screening for lots of neurodevelopmental issues. And that's not just children in detention, that's children who hit justice in any way, it's probably children who hit child protective services as well. We need to be able to have a process of trying to identify early who these children are who've got existing disabilities. And what else needs to happen? Well, some of it are the upstream stuff that we've talked about. So being able to find children who are coming through other services, whether it's through education or health services or anywhere else, that we find them and, and see them at, at a young age, as young as possible. And then it's even further upstream work, right? So this is support for families, for young mothers, um, re-engaging with community, uh, identifying healthy practices, you know, and, and again, this stuff is, you know, gets well outside of you know, a doctor or someone else providing any care and input. This is about communities coming together and, and having the support of their society to, to lead on these issues. Um, but that's where we're going to find those key um, intervention points, I think. 
Mm. Um, the next question I've got uh, is from Sheridan Ward, and there's a couple of questions uh, that touch on this um, as well. But Sheridan's question is, how does the minimum age of 10 years old compare to other countries? Um, and there's a couple of questions here about are there examples from here or overseas of successful programs and responses um, uh, to this? I'm not, I'm not sure who wants to answer that one. Mina, is that one for you maybe or Sophie? Yeah, I'm happy, happy to look into that. Um, so the median age around the world is 14 years of age for the criminal responsibility. So in terms of that, Australia's out of step. And uh, earlier this year, we had the Universal Periodic Review, which is a process as part of the United Nations where uh, countries' human rights records are examined by other countries. And at that uh, Universal Periodic Review earlier this year, 30 other countries called out Australia um, for having such a low age of, of criminal responsibility. Um, I saw someone posted in the comments that the United Nations um, has also said that uh, the minimum age of criminal responsibility should be 14, give, taking into account um, child developmental processes and such. Um, so the Australian government has just kind of said, well, that's an issue for the states and territories. Um, and so, as Sophie said, that's why, you know, lots of work is going into working with the states and territories to try and raise the age across each of those jurisdictions. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many other countries that have um, uh, criminal responsibility at 14 years of age. Um, there's a number of European countries, South American countries, African countries, Asian countries. There's there's a lot of different countries. Um, and there are lots of countries that also have as high as 18 because I saw someone um, post in the chat as well that we should raise the age to 18. Um, but absolutely, we need to look to um, overseas jurisdictions for those positive examples of what does work. Um, but, you know, I think like Julie and Sophie and, and Nick, like we've all said, you know, it's it, it's really looking at where the gaps are in a child's development and thinking about what do they not have that puts them in a position that makes them more vulnerable to becoming engaged with the criminal legal system. Um, so where are the gaps in, in, in learning, in development, um, the gaps in connection to culture, in, fa in terms of family? Um, how are we addressing those things in a child's life? And are we, are we addressing them earlier rather than later? Um, and, you know, there are so many, there are lots of different um, things that we wouldn't necessarily see as diversion programs or early intervention programs that actually are. Those things of, of, of like Julie said, you know, the kids engaging in Oztag, engaging in something that keeps them connected with the groups around, with other kids around them, that keeps them healthy, that keeps them active, um, things like homework programs um, or after school programs that kids can, can go to, um, you know, cultural connections. So many Aboriginal organisations have so many different programs that connect kids um, with their culture and their identity. And we know, especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids, once we're strong in our identity and our culture, there's so much that we can achieve. That's a, such a crucial element to it. So whenever we do think about what things need to be um, put in place, specifically for Aboriginal kids and Torres Strait Islander kids, culture needs to be front and centre because it is a source of strength for us. Yeah, Julie, can I come back to you on that one? You were just talking about successful programs that your daughter has helped um, foster in your community. What are your observations of, of what works for communities? Well, just with well, my daughter and these, uh, well, the two youth ambassadors with them yarning with the young people out here in Mount Druitt. So they, I don't know, it's easier for them to listen to one another to say what they feel needs to change. So with their group that um, meets regularly, um, they call, it's called Mount Yarn. So they meet and have these conversations with the young people and, and out of that group, they or we're hoping that, um, you know, they create some sort of resource that, that can be shared with, with other services, you know, giving them, you know, an idea like this is work type thing where, you know, this has been going for three comps um, and it's just been going so good. So it's 
it's just doing things differently and these kids wanting um, change as well and want services to work differently because they know, you know, they're not getting that support. So it's, yeah. it's a good thing that they're doing that. Definitely. And we've certainly seen through the pandemic that, for example, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have been uh, in often cases more successful than Australia's general medical system at protecting mob and communities, um, keeping the pandemic out. Unfortunately, yeah. um, that's broken down um, recently, but um, yeah, it's definitely, you can see those success stories, not just in systems like Just Reinvest, but um, elsewhere where they're led by Aboriginal communities. Um, yeah. I did want to just ask to kind of finish up, we've got a couple of people here commenting on, you know, it must be very costly to imprison children uh, and that you've talked a lot about then it gets them in a, in a vicious cycle. There's a lot of recidivism and that type of thing. Um, a question here from Rosemary Rowe says, does it cost half a million dollars to imprison our kids? And is Australia in breach of international law? Um, Sophie, I might come to you on, on that one. How expensive is it? Yeah, extremely expensive. So about the like the cheapest that you can lock up a child is about half a million dollars, um, but it goes up to, you know, in some places it's um, well over $800,000 for um, to lock up a child in a, in a prison. I mean, if you, you think about that, it is a, a fraction um, of that cost to invest in community-driven programs to support young people. So we're not just talking about that. So the, the big Deloitte study, you can, um, I'll try and post it in the chats, but you can just Google it, um, which basically looks at what would, what would it cost if we took all of these kids out of the punitive criminal legal system and instead we invested that money in our community sector, in family supports, in raising Centrelink above the poverty line, um, in community controlled health services, um, what would the difference be? It's a fraction of the cost. So they found, um, they looked at the, in the Northern Territory implementing all of the Royal Commission recommendations, and it turns out to be far cheaper to implement this vast set of reforms than to continue business as usual, locking up kids, um, even, you know, it's a relatively small number of children um, in the Northern Territory, it's sort of around 50 children at any given time, um, locking up those kids costs more than instead reforming the criminal justice system, keeping those kids out, investing in the health and community services instead. We also know when it comes to the long-term impacts, a, a child who is put in prison is so much more likely to be unable to work, finish their education, end up unemployed, have mental and physical health issues and disabilities in the future, even suffer premature death. When you factor all of that in, and hopefully we can, we can do this for reasons beyond just a, a cost-benefit analysis, but if you just want to look at that in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, it is obviously so much more expensive to deny all of these young people the, the, the possibility of their futures being in gainful employment, owning a home, finishing education, contributing to the economy. You take all that away when you lock a child up and deny them um, the ability to pursue you know, their hopes and dreams and, and their own ambitions. Um, so in short, it's much cheaper, much, much cheaper um, to keep kids out of the criminal legal system and to instead invest in the type of services that keep kids healthy and keep families and communities together. Yeah, Julie, I might come to you to finish up. Um, in an ideal world, you know, uh, what kind of future do you want, uh, just even in your own community in Mount Druitt for kids like your daughter? What are we aiming for? Um, creating change you know, around policing, around services. It's around a bit of everything, but cre creating change, you know, for those who are struggling and just doing things differently. Like, as an example, like, my daughter was uh, well in custody over 100 days and it's like over $1,400 per day. Like, when you think about how much money is wasted where we should be looking at doing things differently. Or, yeah. or government should be listening to people in the community, how how things should, you know, work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and if people want to know how they can support the campaign, Sophie, um, where should they go? 
I just posted some links in the chat, um, but if you, you want to sign up to the campaign, if you haven't signed the petition yet, you can go to raisetheage.org.au forward slash change the record. Um, or if you want to take some more direct action and contact your MP, we have some easy tools set up already on changetherecord.org.au forward slash raise the age. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Julie, Mina, Sophie and Nick for their time today. Thank you so much. We'll have to wrap it up there. We had about 600 people on the line with us today. Thank you all so much for tuning in for this important webinar. We've got more webinars coming up. So head on over to australiainstitute.org.au uh, to find those. And don't forget to listen to our podcast, Follow the Money, where we take big economic issues and explain them in plain English. Uh, and this week's episode is on, oh, I can't think of a non-rude word for it, the situation uh, with fracking and gas in the Northern Territory. Uh, it's basically uh, bad for the environment, bad for climate change. It's costing taxpayers a bomb um, and we're not getting much out of it. So it's a good episode. Tune into that uh, if you like. And thanks so much for tuning in today. Take care, get vaccinated as soon as you can and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks very much, everyone.